1 Thessalonians, where we are covering similar themes. We're going to look at the whole monogenistic, synergenistic uh, things again, touching sanctification, of course, as we start off uh, chapter 4 on a life that is pleasing to God. A lot of your ESV headers will say that. As we, um, spoilers, as we open up, I think I've already spoiled it, as we open up and dive deeper into this text, we are covering what is more specifically the doctrine of sanctification. We're going to look at it more specifically, we're going to look at it more individualistically, and we're going to look at it systematically as well, like the doctrine in and of itself, the actual teaching of sanctification and, and, and how it all works in us. I'm going to move this a little bit over this way, just because you guys are all over there, <laughs> and I don't want to walk all the way over there. Um, as Paul usually uh, does in most of his writings, he tends to follow that grace and law aspect, whereby he'll explain what is true about the Christian. So the first three chapters of Thessalonians have basically been, you guys are awesome, you've confirmed your calling, you're saved by God, good on you, I thank God for you. There's all of this nice and fuzzy and uh, encouraging stuff. And then a little bit later on, in sort of the end of chapter three, as we worked through last week, and the start of chapter four and onwards, he then puts that into application and gives you a bunch of imperatives, which we've looked at in the past. He follows that grace and law style of writing that he does so in many of his other writings. All of his second half of the book is about what to do and how to act in light of everything that he said in the first few chapters, right? So encouragements and grace and then sanctification, which is what we're talking about today, and he uses that word, and law, which is what the Christian should live and breathe for. For the converted Christian, right, for the, for the person who, like we covered in the LBC, all of that uh, effectual calling stuff, for, for that person who has all of that applied to them, how should they act in light of it is what we're talking about. You trust in the finished work of Jesus, and therefore, for Paul here, and many in many other places in Scripture as well, there should be then, for Paul, this what now kind of question. What do we do now in light of what has happened to us, in light of what, have, what, what God has done for us? It is uh, imperative that it flows in that order. Right? I'm going to start off this sermon by making that very clear. In order to live out the Christian life, it presupposes that you're a Christian. Well, then we ask the question, well, what is a Christian? Well, it's exactly what we had just been talking about. You are saved by the regenerating work of Christ Jesus. You are nothing. You have been brought to nothing because of the sin that is dwelling in you. You cannot please God. You know you can't please God. You know there's no way out other than the full and complete work of Christ Jesus. What the Spirit then does in us is He gives us the eyes to see that reality and lean on Him for our salvation. Sanctification then, which is what we're going into today, only comes as a result of that. It does not work conversely. We cannot seek to please God or live a sanctified life without justification. We cannot uh, seek to impress God to have God ple uh, pleased by our works if we have not first bowed the knee to the only person he has given this world for salvation, and that is Jesus Christ. We can't do it. It is a deadly mindset to come to God with those, uh, 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 those aspects of salvation flipped on the other side. We cannot try and live a sanctified life that we may be justified. We must first be saved. We must first be justified. We must first have faith that we could never try hard enough. We could never please him enough. And that Jesus lived perfectly in our place, knowing that we couldn't please him. So it works that way. He calls, and, and Paul assumes that in that way, right? As we, as we cover the, the, the grace and law aspect of Thessalonians, all the other areas of Scripture where it follows a very similar model, Paul knows this. He gives them the grace. He gives them the gospel. He gives them the, the, the exhortations of accepting Christ's gift and salvation. And then he goes to then apply that and teach them how they must live as a result of it. He knows it 
even to the way that he writes these letters. In chapter 1, he calls them brothers. He calls them brothers here even in the opening of, of uh, chapter 4, 4 verse 1. He calls them brothers. He's assuming their Christianity. He mentions that they have confirmed their calling and election in chapter 1 verse 3. He says that he knows that they're brothers that are loved by God in chapter 1 verse 4. He says that they receive the gospel with the joy of the Holy Spirit in chapter 1 verse 5. Right? The assumed reality for these people, these Christians, is not only that they're a church pleasing to God, but at the very elementary level, they are Christians who can get better via sanctification. Right? So starting in chapter 4, we're, we're zooming in on this idea of pleasing God, but from a very individual level. We're zooming into the individual and saying, what can I do personally to be made more holy, to be more conformed into Christ's image? And so let's, pray, uh, let's read, and then we'll, we'll pray, and then we'll get into it. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 1. Finally then, brothers, we ask, and, uh, we ask and urge you in the Lord Jesus that you receive, as you received from us, how you ought to walk and to please God, just as you are doing, that you may do so more and more. For you know what instructions we gave you through the Lord Jesus, for this is the will of God, your sanctification that you abstain from sexual immorality, that each one of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor, not in the passion of lust, like the Gentiles who do not know God, that no one transgress and wrong his brother in all these things. As we told you, the Lord is an avenger in all these things, as we told you before, beforehand and solemnly warned you, for God has not called us for impurity, but in holiness. Therefore, whoever disregards this disregards not man, but God, who gives his Holy Spirit to you. Now concerning brother, brotherly love, you have no need for anyone to write to you, for you yourselves have been taught by God to love one another. For that indeed is what you are doing to all the brothers throughout Macedonia. But we urge you, brothers, to do this more and more, and to aspire to live quietly and to mind your own affairs, and to work with your hands as we instructed you, so that you may walk properly before outsiders and be dependent on no one. Let's pray. God, we know that it is only your spirit that can apply any of, these, uh, any of these exhortations to our hearts, and we would pray for that to happen right now. God, would you uh, enlighten our minds to the understandings of scripture, knowing full well that it is solely you that has done a work in us. May we only live as a result of what you have done. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 I want to have a little bit of a, a, a chat before we work into the, the bulk of the systematic understanding of sanctification, but have a chat about the source of goodness in light of trying to live a life that is pleasing to God. What is the source to find out what we need to do? Where do we go? Where's the foundation, right? Where, where, how do we even kick this conversation off, right? What can we actually uh, what, what can we actually do in order to gain an understanding about the instructions that God has given the Christian in order for him to act pleasing to him? Right? So when we talk about instructions and pleasing God and living a certain way, all of these things presuppose a lot of things. And I suppose the first question would be, how do we know? How do we know what to do? How do we know right from wrong? How do we know that we should do that and not do that? Right? These instructions, how do we get them? Where do we, where do we look for in order to gain this understanding? Do we look to our culture? Right? Do we look to society at large, maybe Hollywood, movies, TV, or what other people do? Maybe spiritual gurus for, for extra help on extra understandings of what specifically we should do, or maybe just people that we really like in our life that are able to tell us a, a, a few good pointers. Right? Do, we, do we look to that or... Do we look to what God has given us as the very standard to be able to apply to our life through the, through the power of the Holy Spirit, which is the Word, which is the very Bible that we have in our hands, profitable for teaching, right, straight breathed out from God, profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete and equipped for every good work. The reality is, we don't, or we shouldn't, we cannot come to conclusions about right and wrong without God. When we do that, things go very wrong, 
And we've seen that. We've seen that particularly in the breakdown of the West, the straying away from Scripture, the straying away from God, the, the adoption of, of all of the abominations that co- God calls abominations. And we see it all break down. People don't even know what gender they are. People don't even know what, how many people they can marry, etc. You see that break down. So when you go away from Scripture, that is what seems to happen. Breakdown of society. However, the Scriptures give us in-depth instructional commands on how we should live our lives. And not only that, God, as the author of life, who has provided for man, being made in his own image, a conscience which bears witness to the fact about all of these beautiful things that God has in Scripture as well. So God has done a lot, a lot of common grace, a lot of revelation so that we can understand things and live a life that is pleasing to him. But what we do in our sin is we do what I said not to do. Unfortunately, at large, society seeks to throw God in the bin and figure out on our own what is right and wrong and what we should be doing. And in some cases, what we should be doing to please God. And so it's all corrupted. The reality is, If we come up with our own set of morals, if we come up with our own set of ideas of how we should do life and live a life that is pleasing pleasing to God, the reality is pleasing God will be on the bottom of our priority list. We would seek to please ourselves. We would seek to please others. We would seek to please uh, what what Paul says here, the the, the worldly desires, the sexual immorality, the, the impurity, the passions of lust and acting as Gentiles do. We would be doing that. We wouldn't be pleasing God. Therefore, what God has done us is a miraculous work in giving us a new heart and giving us the scriptures that we may be conformed to him. He says in verse 1, Finally then, brothers, we ask and urge you in the Lord Jesus, just as you receive from us as you ought to walk and to please God, just as you are doing that you should do so more and more. How you ought to walk presupposes a set of oughts which were set in place by the very God that we're seeking to please. That's how good God is. He gives us this list. He, he lists uh, what we should do in order to please him. We, as a result of our justification, that should be added. He gives us the information that we need. We need not look anywhere else. He lists it as a result of doing what we ought. We then in turn please him in the Lord Jesus. And then he uses the word instructions. That, that word for instructions there in chapter 2 in the ancient day is a, is a similar word that they would use for commanders giving out instructions to lower officers in order to do the work that they needed to do military in, in a military setting. So there are instructions being handed out. For you know what instructions we gave you through the Lord Jesus And notice how they're through the Lord Jesus, right? They are in order to please God, and they are through Jesus. Jesus, of course, being the chief example of what it is to be a human pleasing God. Notice how he doesn't say uh, uh, God, or he doesn't say uh, Jesus Christ, or he doesn't say Lord Almighty Jesus Christ, or the Creator Jesus. He just says... Lord Jesus, assuming, of course, the the, the humanity of Jesus and that he is the greatest example of a man we could ever have that pleased God in every single way, never committing a sin and only ever living positively righteous, fulfilling the law completely. The way you should live, the way you should be pleasing to God should be done through the example of the man that was given to you, the Lord Jesus, who in turn died for your sins, full well knowing that you weren't able to please him perfectly. And then he goes on to prove why we do this. We'll look at verse 3. Why we do this. And we sort of alluded to this already. Why do we live this life of sanctification? Well, for this is the will of God. It is the will of God that his children be sanctified. Right, we ever ask that question, right? A lot of that, that question gets thrown around a lot these days of, I don't know what the will of God is for my life. I don't know what he wants. Maybe he wants me to do this ministry or maybe he wants me to get that job or try and do this or he, he wants me to marry that person. And we ask all of these grand questions that only God knows. And yet God has revealed right here that one of the primary things that he has in store for you is your sanctification. That's on his list of priorities. He he says that so clear and so uh, openly. This is the will of God 
your sanctification. This is not to say that we can't speculate on where God wants us to be and where, like, what he wants us to do. Those ambitions are awesome, but at its elementary, fundamental level, what we can say, the will of God for the Christian is that they be sanctified. They be more holy. Our lives should conform more and more to the image of Christ, right? To sanctify something is to make it holy. It comes from the the Latin word to make holy, to sanctify it, to conform to the word of God in the ways that he has revealed that we should follow his commands and be more holy, to live a changed life, to live a life that reflects the conversion experience which we had when we had faith in Jesus in the first place. It reflects that idea, which boils down then to the cause of all of this. And I mentioned earlier, but I'll mention it again because we need to nail this down. The cause of all of that is the Spirit's work in us. It's the primary mover in all of this ordeal, in sanctification. That is our regeneration and our justification, which is primary. Right? This then starts to creep in into all of those indicative and imperative distinctions that we've talked about in the past. Right? The imperative is, you be made more holy. The indicative is, because you are Christian, you're saved. God has done something to you. You have the, you have the ability, you have the wills, you should have the behaviors, you have the desires now to live for God, live a changed life, on the basis of the indicative being, you have been justified. You have been filled with the Holy Spirit. You are a new creation. You have been born again. Do you see those? Do you see how that works? Do you see the imperatives and the indicatives there through the text? The imperatives are found all over this text of how we should live, what we should do, how to please God, how to abstain from sexual immorality, but the indicative which provides us with the only basis to which any of that is even possible is the fact that we're saved and justified. That at the point of conversion, your heart of stone is turned to flesh, you have eyes to see the truth of the gospel, all of those beautiful things we were talking about in the LBC apply to you. No longer deserving of condemnation because Christ was condemned in your place. What then flows from that, what then flows from that reality is a life of sanctification whereby God, he continually saves that person from the power of sin. They're saved from the penalty of sin at their justification. That's a once and for all declaration that that individual need not be punished for their sin. Their debt is paid. They have no condemnation. What then flows from that is sanctification, that God continually saves them from the power of sin. Verse 22 of Romans chapter 6. I would actually invite you to turn to Romans chapter 6 because we're going to spend a little bit of time there. Romans chapter 6, verse 22. Now that you have been set free from sin and become slaves of God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification and at its end, eternal life. That eternal life is, of course, glorification. We're going to look at that a lot next week. But for now, the fruit in which the Christian produces, which comes as a result of being set free from sin, and that's justification, then leads to our sanctification. And 1 Thessalonians, uh, 1 Thessalonians 4, 7 to 8, for God has not called us for impurity, but in holiness. Therefore, whoever disregards this disregards not man, but God who gives his Holy Spirit to you. Again, Romans 6, 17 to 19, all the same themes. He goes into fuller depth in Romans chapter 6 because it has all to do with our lives that we live as a result of Romans chapter 3 and 4 that have to do with our salvation being by faith and faith alone. Thanks be to God in in, uh, 6, 17. Thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed. And having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. For you were once presented your your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness. So now present your members as slaves to righteousness, leading to sanctification. The reformers used to call this mortification and vivification. This is how we can break down sanctification. 
Mortification is to do exactly what Paul has said here thus far in Romans chapter 6. To die. To die to sin. That's where we get the, the word mortal from or, 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 um, or uh, to mortify something is to kill it, to have nothing to do with it. This is what we're talking about in the Latin. To mortify your sin. This former manner of life which we consistently lived in, is now, as a result of what is true about us in Christ, mortified. It needs to die. It needs to not be you anymore. The former manner of life uh, should be dead to us. To be a Christian is to realize that Christ's saving work is real for us, and it applies to us. And that at his, at his crucifixion, as he died for us on the cross, it is in a very real way how we then die to sin. And he makes that connection in Romans chapter 6, which we'll look at. This is what repentance looks like. This is what it looks like to turn, to do a 180 away from sin, to realize that I no longer need to live as an enemy of God, but can live as a son of God because of what he has done for me. Dying to that old manner of life to which we lived as an enemy of God. Dying to that previous life that we were previously enslaved to sin in. Verse 19. For just as once you presented your members as slave to impurity and to lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness. And then there's this continuing command in Scripture, literally, to die to that previous life. Right? We see elsewhere the, the cutting off the man that Jesus says when he says to cut off your right hand if it causes you to sin or cut out your eye, pl uh, pluck it out if it causes you to sin, kill it, mortify it, cut it off, throw it in the fire because sin is like a tumor or a cancer. It is often described in scripture as a, a leaven. When left to grow and permeate, it infects the entire lump. It will consume the entire being. As John Owen famously said, he said, be killing sin or it will be killing you. Therefore, we must mortify it. This is what it means to, uh, in the mortification aspect of sanctification. Mortify it, the reformers would say. Be dead to it. Be dead to it knowing that Christ died for it. And there is absolutely no right for you as a Christian, to add to Christ's sacrifice unnecessarily. It says in Romans 6, verse 1 and 2, What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? It goes on to say that we were buried with him in the regard that when we were born again, we died to sin. Therefore, let us act like it, show that reality in us as opposed to, to what Paul says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, as opposed to the way the Gentiles live, the spiritual Gentiles, those who, who will not come to faith, those who deny the faith and live out what is true about them, that they are in the kingdom of darkness. We are not that. We live not in the passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God. So what is true about us means we don't act like them, spiritual Gentiles who live out their deadness to God and who are alive and love their sin. And then there's that second aspect of sanctification, vivification, right? This comes from the word uh, uh, vita, like vita, to, to live, right? Be alive. It's, it's the complete opposite of mortification. It is to be alive to exactly the opposite of what we're talking about. Mortification is to die to sin. Vivification is to be alive to righteousness, to live a changed life. It is quite the opposite, much like, much like the resurrection of Christ, like the resurrection of Christ, which Paul also alludes to in, in uh, Romans chapter 6 to make this point, we are not just dead to sin and then remain neutral. Like, we're good now. We'll just, we'll just not do certain things and we won't accept doing better things. That's not us. We are not just dead and then remain neutral. Rather, we now live alive to righteousness. Verse 4 in Romans 6. We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. And he's not just talking about justification. This is key. He uses the same themes which are the grounds of our justification, being that God does this work in the first place, right? However, it's not just that. The life that you must now live 
must reflect the reality of being justified by Jesus. Just as Christ was buried and killed for our sin, and he rose to life, conquering sin and death, so too the Christian not only should have sin and death conquered, but should live unto righteousness, right? Uh, tapping into the power that was given to you by the Spirit in order to live more holy. You couldn't do it on your own. We're not saying that. We're saying that because God saved you, you may walk in newness of life. You can walk in newness of life, mortifying your sin and living for the one who made this entire thing possible. Verses 8 to 11. Now, if we have died to Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him for the death he died to sin once and for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Mortification and vivification. Then the question can be asked, well, if it's all God, what is my role in all of this? Or what are the roles? What is the, what is the harmony between the roles of us and God? How much does he do? How much do we do? What are the roles when it comes to sanctification? Right? We talked to all of this about it being God's work. He's the one that initiated, initiated it all. If Jesus didn't live and die, we not only don't get sanctified, but we don't get saved altogether. We're not even justified in the first place. So God does this initiating work because we don't start looking any different unless he intervenes and saves. We know that the salvific act of justification is monogenistic. We know that for a fact. We cover that in the LBC, right? We know we're dead in trespasses and sins. We don't come to God. He comes to, he chooses us. He loved us, but God being rich in mercy, he made you alive with Christ Jesus, monogenistic. He was the only one that worked in us, right? However, there are two monogenistic errors when facing sanctification. And I'm arguing that sanctification is synergenistic. On the opposite side of the spectrum, we work or cooperate with God to produce in us uh, sanctification, being made more holy, being more conformed into Christ's image. And here's how I'll argue it. We look at two church history heresies that convey a monogenistic approach to sanctification, activism and quietism, sometimes called passivism, activism and quietism. Now, activism sounds great. Like, yeah, we should be active. We should be trying to be more holy. That's, that's, that's a good thing, right? But activism is not quite what that is. Activism sounds great, but falls short to import the Spirit's work in our sanctification. What activism says is they adopt a form that will say that humans uh, work solely to provide sanctification. Meaning that once God has saved you, you're on your own. You have to live out this life and be made more holy completely on your own. He saved you. Cool. You're a Christian now. But after that, it's all you. Go and do your thing. Try and be made more holy. Leaving the responsibility solely on man as to the power in which can make it all possible. Sanctification then wholly depends on the human's new will to function in accordance with the law of God. Grace is left to the side only as a remedy for weak people and personal effort is encouraged in order to obey God and to conform to Christ's image. They are active in the sense that their own effort actively produces holiness in and of itself. That's heresy. Throw that in the bin, right? The Spirit's work is totally necessary in our sanctification. However, as fallible as we are and as, as, as shaky as we are as humans, we seem to go from extremes to extremes. And now we'll look at quietism. Quietism, on the flip side, is the complete opposite. Quietism is also monogenistic, but on the other extreme. They'll confess that in order for the Christian to be made more holy, he must, they'll say, remain quiet. Remain quiet. Take a step back and let the Spirit do its work. Therefore, man has absolutely no responsibility for holiness whatsoever. It is completely the Spirit's work in you. We must remain quiet. They'll say things like, let go and let God. 
if you've heard that one before. They'll say things like that. We can't do anything. We rather are removed from the responsibility to live holy as the finger can then just be pointed at God and say, I guess God's lacking in me. I can't give up this sin because God is lacking. I wish he would just try a bit harder and I would be made more holy. Therefore, the responsibility is completely removed from the sinner and the fingers are then pointed at God. R.C. Sproul said, In activism, God's working is swallowed up by human self-righteousness. And conversely, in quietism, the human struggle is swallowed up by an automatic divine process, which is very unhelpful. What a helpful way is to eradicate both extremes and to realize that sanctification is synergistic. We work cooperatively with God in order to produce in us holiness as a result, of course, of the monogenistic act done by him in our justification and our salvation. Sproul also said, we are to resist unto blood, to wrestle with powers, to pummel our bodies, rejoicing in the certainty that the Holy Spirit is within us, helping, disposing, convicting, and encouraging. Right? We looked at all the personal convicting examples which the Holy Spirit inspired in Scripture of personal devotion, how we can get better, how we can mortify our sin. But then Paul says in uh, Ephesians 5, 25 and 26, when he's making that comparison between husbands and wives and 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 Christ and his church, what does he say? He says, husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. That applies for husbands. That also applies for God with his church. God presents the church blameless. The church is also responsible for being presented blameless. We work together. God and man work together to conform man to godliness. Yes, God gets the glory for it. Yes, God initiated it. Yes, God destined the entire thing to happen, but it is our responsibility to live these lives of godliness as a result of all of those beautiful things. It is our responsibility. That takes us back to the, the whole, the, the triple G's, right? The, the guilt, grace, and gratitude aspect of our salvation. We're brought low, we're guilty, we're justified and saved when, when he shows us grace. And then as a result of that, we show gratitude to him by living unto him as a result of what he has done for us. We're, we're guilty, we're vile, he showed us grace. Now, the least we could do is live a life for the rest of our existence, continually showing him gratitude for all that he has done. That is what's true for the Christian, not only now, but forevermore and into glory. We will only ever show gratitude to our God for what he has done in us. And to say that we just remain quiet and we just chill and he continues to do his work and we can still love our sin is heresy. We cannot stoop to that, but rather we should be grateful to our God who has saved us. Back to 1 Thessalonians, he says in verse 7 of chapter 4, For God has not called us for impurity, but in holiness. Therefore, Whoever disregards this, disregards not man, but God, who gives his Holy Spirit to you. He gave his Holy Spirit to you. How dare we say that he has called us for impurity? Or that it is, for whatever reason, his fault that we are not made holy. Or it is uh, uh, solely uh, our work and not the fact that he gave us the Holy Spirit. It removes all of those heresies and says that we don't split that up. We say... We work together with God so that we may be grateful to him and also show that he has done a fantastic work in us, therefore giving him all of the glory. Let us show him gratitude by dying to ourselves and living for him. And then he gives us a a specific example. He talks about sexual morality in the church. 1 Thessalonians 3 to 6 in chapter 4. This is the will of God, your sanctification, we've covered that, that you abstain from sexual immorality. That each one of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor, not in the passions of lust like the Gentiles do who do not know God, that no one transgress and wrong his brother in this matter, because the Lord is an avenger in all of these things, as we told you beforehand and solemnly warned you. Sexual immorality. One of the most greatest examples that Paul could have given in order to target the heart of any Christian that seeks to walk this life of holiness. 
This is one of the greatest examples that he could give. It is the most pervasive sin that plagues this world, particularly even in the days of the Thessalonians, right, where, where openly sexual sin was rampant in the day. Prostitution was common, right? Brothels were very common. Slave wives were, were, were uh, very common. Concubines, homosexuality, and all sorts of other abominations were constantly practiced and loved by uh, the, the areas surrounding that Macedonian and Greek region. Paul no doubt knows that by talking about this, he's not only convicting the non-Christians, but knows for a fact that even those who are listening in the congregation would have previously struggled with a lot of the different sinful activities that, are, that were rampant in the day. And he says, abstain from it. Abstain from sexual immorality. That word sexual morality translates to porneia. Right? In the Greek, it's used elsewhere to describe any sexual activity that is performed outside the consensual marriage between a man and a woman. And yes, everything, everything that doesn't fall under that category. And there are no excuses. There are no sugarcoating this. There is nothing to say sorry for because it's God's holiness we are talking about. It is God's church we are seeking to protect. There are no excuses here. There is no, what if, what if he really loves him and he wants to get married to him? No. Right? What if, what if uh, her and her and him and they and they them want to get married? No, there is nothing like that that is being, uh, uh, that is being compromised here. What if he's my boyfriend and I think he'll marry me one day? No. Paul says no to any form of sexual morality. Any sexual conduct or lust outside of the context of a marriage, which by definition is between a man and a woman, is sexual immorality and looked down upon by God. And if it's not clear enough, right, the severity of this sin, I've counted over 40 times that this exact word is used, or in similar terms, in the New Testament itself. This sin is particularly pervasive because in its nature, it is a sin against your own body. You would have heard this elsewhere in 1 Corinthians. So you can turn to there if you like. It is to, to defile yourself, which has been purchased by Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 16-20. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For as it is written, the two will become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Flee from sexual immorality. Every other person commits sin outside the body, but sexual immorality is a, is a sin against his own body. Do you not know that the body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own. You were bought with a price, so glorify God with your own body. Paul savagely hates sexual immorality, and he does so for a reason. It is particularly cancer. It is particularly leaven which will infect the whole lump if we dabble in it. It was not only needed in their age, but also needed in our age, where sexual immorality is still openly celebrated in the streets, where it is so easy to access pornography, where sex before marriage is so ce celebrated, where, where homosexuality is seen as brave and praiseworthy. This call against sexual immorality is all the more needed. Sex for the Christian is to look different, is to be set apart. Right? We understand sex. We understand that it is a God-given beauty and it has a specific purpose. And let's not look at that like the world looks at it and treat it like the world treats it. Let us not look at, uh, point the finger at God in rebellion and use one of God's given gifts to mankind for corruption and debauchery with an added warning that's given here in 1 Thessalonians 4.6. The Lord is an avenger in all these things. He is an avenger in all these things, as we told you beforehand and solemnly warned you. God brings chastisement to those who rebel against him, and we shouldn't take that warning lightly. Rather, we should, verse 4 and 5, know how to control his own body in holiness and honor, not in the passion of lust like the Gentiles who don't know God. You know God. You should be set apart and different. That's the indicative imperative. It's a different reality. Know how to control your own body in holiness and honor. Notice how he says later that, this is, that, that it's targeted at men, of course, because men will struggle with this, but it's to not wrong other men. 
It's interesting how that works. Men are the ones who are more naturally enticed to do this sin, and the warning is not to do it and to not do it against other brothers. It says it there. That's, that's someone's wife. That's someone's daughter. That's someone's sister. Do not give in to that brothers, he says. He has not called you to impurity, but in holiness. Whoever disregards this disregards not man, but God, who gave the Holy Spirit to you. And then in application, we can look at verses 9 to 12. Concerning brotherly love, you, may not, you have no need for anyone to write to you, for you yourselves have been taught by God to love one another. Verse 10, for, for, what is indeed is what, for, for that indeed is what you are doing to all the brothers throughout Macedonia, but we urge you brothers to do this more and more to aspire to live quietly and to mind your own affairs, to work with your hands as we instructed you so that you may walk pro properly before outsiders and be dependent on no one. That's the immediate application that will help to cure all of those issues. That, that he reminds them that they're still inclining. He reminds them that they're still doing well, that you still have love and that love is being sounded forth throughout your country. He is reminding them that though they may be struggling with this particular sin or that they may have something that is lacking in their faith, like we covered last week, it might not be a linear increase in their sanctification, but he does remind them that it is still a net improvement from the Gentile activity that they were used to, right? Sanctification is not linear. It is not we get from here to here in a straight line, but rather there may be ups and downs, but we know for a fact that God will complete his work in us. We will get better. And we can know that. We can know that as a reality in and of ourselves. We can, we can fast track. If we've been a Christian for 20 years, we can know for a fact that 20 years ago, I, am not, I was not the same person as I am now. And it's because of what God has done in us. It is because of his goodness. It is not a linear trajectory, but a rocky one that we may improve all the more. They struggle with some things. Maybe Paul has to supply what's lacking in their faith, but they are improving as what they are doing is being heard throughout Macedonia. The encouragement, though, remains the same. He says, do this all the more. Right, there's a really high standard there, but he says it. Do this all the more. Stay busy, stay holy, keep growing. And he says, work with your hands as we instructed you so that you may walk properly before outsiders and be dependent on no one. A call there, stay busy at work, work so that people may see you lest we be idle and be distracted by sexual morality and such other sins that may creep in and then become issues for us. If we stay busy, we will not fall into such traps in all of the different ways that God has called us to be busy, whether it's church, whether it's work or whether it's family. That is the immediate application for us. And the other application is a reminder that we don't do any of this unless, yet again, we have bent the knee to Christ Jesus and all of the work that he has done for our salvation. And so if there is anyone listening who has not yet done that, you need to come now. We do not know when our days will end, but we know for a fact that Jesus is willing and able to save anyone who draws near. And if we have faith in that reality, we, we can be saved. Let's pray. God, we know that our works and our fruit are only a result of the work that you have done in us. Lord, we know that we cannot seek to earn favor with you or earn uh, a striving for our own salvation and what we have done. Lord, we know for a fact that everything that you have provided for us is the basis of which we can even grow the basis of which we can even increase in holiness and, and uh, increase in all of these good works that you have prepared for us beforehand. Lord, we thank you for your love, for your people. We only pray that you would continually add to us uh, uh, more understandings of your word, that we may apply more of your word to our lives, that we may uh, uh, take heed the warnings and scriptures to be made more holy, to be more sanctified, to grow in our holiness, that we may be an example to all around of what God can do in people. Let us be those who love you because you have first loved us. In Jesus' name, amen.